This year marks 39 years since the Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster. The world had never seen a catastrophe of this scale before, and hopefully never will again. But the events that unfolded during the cleanup were just as dramatic as the explosion itself. Humanity had never faced radiation levels this extreme, and yet people managed to overcome it. In this video, I'll tell you about the unique trucks that were used in the disaster response. They were built in record time, with one main goal in mind, to provide maximum radiation protection for the driver. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe, like, and hit the bell icon so you don't miss new videos. It's a small gesture, but it really helps the channel grow. You've probably seen the dramatic footage of soldiers cleaning radioactive debris from the rooftop of the reactor. But all of that contaminated material had to be removed and buried in special disposal sites. Regular trucks weren't up to the task. Radiation levels were so high, a driver could receive a lethal dose in just a few minutes. The Kras 256 dump truck was chosen as the base vehicle. Despite being outdated by 1986, it was still in production and remained so until 1994. And when I say outdated, I mean it literally. The truck had virtually no comfort and the cabin was a wooden frame covered with sheet metal. Still, the Kras proved its reliability in the harshest conditions. Even today, it's not uncommon to see these trucks still in use. The call to build a special batch of trucks for Chernobyl came in on the evening of Sunday, June 22, 1986. This was an unprecedented challenge, not just for the Kras plant, but for the entire world. Engineers had to start from scratch. A special task group was formed under the chief engineer's office, bringing together the plant's top designers. The lead engineer on the liquidator truck project was Viktor Kolyavko. The main task the engineers faced was to provide reliable protection for the driver from radioactive exposure. To achieve this, the driver had to be enclosed in a special sealed capsule that was impermeable to radiation. Initially, the idea was to install this capsule inside the standard factory cab. One reason for this approach was the client's requirement to keep the vehicle's true purpose disguised. However, when they attempted to fit the filtration and ventilation system, they realized the stock cab would require extensive modifications. As a result, they decided to eliminate the cab altogether, sacrificing stealth in order to meet the urgent production deadlines. Building the capsule itself was no easy task. It was assembled from special layered panels. The outer layers were three millimeter thick steel sheets, while the inner space was filled with lead. The lead shielding was 30 millimeters thick in the floor, 25 millimeters in the sidewalls, and 12 millimeters in the roof. To produce the first prototype, they had to gather large quantities of lead from across the region and to manufacture a full batch of these trucks. A rapid delivery of 60 tons of lead was arranged from Kazakhstan. The windows of the protective capsule were made of special radiation-resistant glass, measuring 300 by 300 millimeters and 75 millimeters thick. These glass blocks were transparent with a dark yellow hue. The windshield blocks were framed in lead and equipped with a standard Kras 256 dump truck half windshield and a pneumatic wiper. Due to delays in the delivery of the glass blocks from Moscow, the first eight capsules were produced without side windows. The interior lining of the capsule was made from eight millimeter thick vinyl plastic. Each finished capsule was tested for radiation permeability. In areas where radiation leakage was detected, additional external lead panels were added. The lead lined capsule turned out to be extremely heavy. Its weight exceeded three tons. Moreover, the weight was unevenly distributed requiring reinforcement of the left frame rail, the left front spring, and installation of a special subframe. To simplify steering in the unbalanced vehicle, the power steering pump was adjusted for higher pressure. For maximum driver protection and capsule sealing, mechanical control systems were replaced with hydro-pneumatic and pneumatic electric ones. For example, the clutch was operated hydro-pneumatically, and the middle axle was fitted with air-actuated brake chambers. To avoid complications with the transfer case controls, it wasn't connected at all. Low gear was permanently engaged and could only be disengaged 
using an electro-pneumatic actuator. The ventilation and filtration system was powered by the engine's generator, or by four batteries, increased from standard, in case the engine stalled. To prevent accidental engine shutdown and avoid situations where it couldn't be restarted due to dead batteries, the manual fuel shutoff lever was relocated outside the capsule. This meant the engine could only be stopped by opening the capsule. To simplify production, the vehicle was not equipped with a cabin heater. It was assumed that the Chernobyl cleanup would be completed before the onset of cold weather. The first prototype of the specialized dump truck rolled out of the experimental workshop on July 10th and was test-driven near Kremenchuk the following day. The vehicle drove out of the factory on its own. We just couldn't get used to the fact that the cabin inside was small and there was only one window, in the front. Side visibility was only through mirrors. Each vehicle was equipped with four mirrors, two for rear view, two for side view, all of them hemispherical. The loud noise was unusual. It was the sound of air being pumped into the capsule by the ventilation system. We drove along the highway through the village of Peshno, near Kremenchuk, and in the center of the village, turning off the road, we exited to its western outskirts, where the Chernobyl vehicle was driven out onto a bumpy meadow overgrown with grass. Our doubts about the vehicle's off-road capability, although it was unloaded but with a heavy front end, disappeared. The vehicle moved confidently through the field, in low areas of which water sparkled through the grass. We drove with the capsule door closed, moved both forward and backward, imitated approaching an excavator, which in this case was represented by a lone willow tree. After one or two tries, we quickly got the hang of it. Driving the vehicle was not a problem, even when maneuvering in reverse. We relied only on the mirrors for orientation. During the following week, the plant workers completed assembly of the first batch of seven special dump trucks. They were immediately shipped to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant by rail. The last Kras trucks from this special industrial batch were delivered on July 27th, almost exactly a month after the assignment was received. In total, 18 liquidator dump trucks were produced. The truck chassis were assembled on the main conveyor while the installation of the driver's capsule and other modifications were carried out in the factory's experimental workshop. The plant workers who fulfilled this important order worked with true dedication in two or even three shifts. No one complained because everyone understood how critical this task was and that the lives of those involved in the disaster response depended on how quickly the vehicles were completed. After all, the liquidation work never stopped. And before the arrival of the special Kras trucks, people had to protect themselves from radiation using improvised means and makeshift methods. The exact fate of these trucks remains unknown, but it is highly likely that after completing their mission, they were buried in a special landfill for contaminated equipment in the village of Burakovka, not far from the Chernobyl plant. There is also no video footage showing these vehicles in action only a few rare photographs. And that's not surprising since people working near the destroyed reactor at that time clearly had more pressing matters than capturing content. Of course, in addition to the special Kras, other vehicles also took part in the Chernobyl disaster cleanup. Equipment that operated in areas with high radiation levels had cabins protected with lead shielding, while vehicles used in less contaminated zones often had no radiation protection at all. However, all vehicles used in the exclusion zone were officially designated as non-exit. They were strictly forbidden from leaving the cleanup area. Standard license plates were replaced with so-called non-exit plates, like on this police car, for example. The highest-ranking non-exit vehicle turned out to be a government limousine, the GAZ-14 Chaika. Eventually, it was transported to a special disposal site for contaminated equipment and buried along with the rest. And as for our hero today, the Kras with its sealed lead-lined capsule, this was truly a one-of-a-kind machine. It wasn't pretty, it wasn't fast, but it accomplished a task no other vehicle could. It helped save the lives of those who worked in the very heart of the Chernobyl disaster. These trucks weren't built for parades or museum displays. They are a symbol of real sacrifice, the kind of heroism 
that rarely makes it into newsreels. Thanks for watching until the end. Share your thoughts in the comments, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to hit the like button. See you in the next video.